Hi everyone, in this video we will talk about the statistics that we're going to use in analytical chemistry. So first of all, like everything, you can use statistics in a way that makes sense with your experimental data and the realities of your measurement, and you can use statistics in ways that obscure your true result. So you have to be careful with that. Okay, we'll start with the simple stuff. You've done this before. This is mean or, or the average. And there's a fancy formula here, but you know how to do this. Do note that this mean, when we write it with the X with the bar on top, that's for a finite set of measurements. It's not all the measurements in the world. The true mean, which we also call the population mean, would be if you did every single measurement possible in the universe, you would get mu, which is your true mean. We never actually get the true mean. We can get really close, but we never actually hit it. So this is standard deviation. You've used this before. The formula is listed on the page here. Don't do the formula by hand. You can use the statistical function in your calculator, or you can use Excel and just highlight all your numbers and say standard deviation. One thing to note, and this we'll see throughout the slideshow here, is we use n for number of measurements, and this we use a lot. n minus 1 is what's called the degrees of freedom. And so the reason why you have one less degree of freedom than you do measurements is you can calculate an average from your measurements, but then you could remove one of the experimental numbers. But if you knew the average before you remove the number, you could calculate what that number was. Okay, if that doesn't stick in your brain, that's fine. Just remember degrees of freedom is very different than number of measurements. They're off by one, and it's going to mess you up if you confuse the two. Okay, so anyway, standard deviation, that's that. You can do this in Excel. Just be careful because there are two standard deviations. The ones that we use in experimental science are S, say the one we use, and that is the like set of measurements that you actually have. And so you can say standard deviation dot s or just the regular regular old standard deviation will do this as well. Now if you could take all possible measurements, you would get the population standard deviation, which we call sigma or we represent with sigma. And you can do this in Excel standard deviation dot p for population. But this isn't the case in experimental science measurements because uh, you can't take all the possible measurements. Okay, some other things that are related to standard deviation. Variance is just the square of standard deviation. You'll see that number go by, or you'll see that word go by. That's variance, it's just standard deviation squared. And then we've used this in lab. The relative standard deviation is the standard deviation divided by the average. And then you turn it into a percentage. This number is useful because if your standard deviation is one and your measurement average is one, that's a big problem. If your standard deviation is one and your measurement average is 20,000, who cares? That's fine, right? So that's why it's useful to sometimes set your standard deviation over the average. That's the RSD, relative standard deviation. Okay, so those are the things you know. Let me then kind of move through other things that you probably already know, and if you don't, that's totally fine. So I'm gonna talk about the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution here which is this idea on the picture on the right, that if you take a bunch of measurements, you will have some average of your measurements, and then your numbers, if you plot them, they will kind of spread out from that average. Your most probable measurement is probably where your average is, although it's not always the case. And you have less probability of observing this value farther out from your middle, and then similarly on the right side, there's less probability that you'll measure a number out here. And so this is called the Gaussian distribution. The boxes here are measurements in these kind of bins. The actual distribution is this nice smooth curve that goes up and down and around. And that's the Gaussian distribution. Now, a couple of things of note about the Gaussian distribution. The standard deviation of your measurements affects how wide the distribution is. And so this figure here is showing what would happen if you had, say, some measurement, which is this top one up here. 
that has a standard deviation of 0.09, and that's this curve up here. The, if you double the standard deviation, then you get this broader curve here. So the width of the curve, kind of how wide it is, depends on the standard deviation. Another thing of note is that one standard deviation away from the mean, if you take that on both sides of the mean in a Gaussian distribution, then the total area between plus or minus one standard deviation is 68.3% of all of your possible measurements. Then if you take this out to two standard deviations, then that's 95% of measurements. And oftentimes we call that good enough. Like, okay, if you're within two standard deviations of the mean, you're doing pretty well. If you wanted to go up to three standard deviations away from the mean, either above it or below it, then you will encompass 99.7% of all measurements if you're measuring something that happens according to the Gaussian distribution. Now, generally, you can assume that a set of measurements is Gaussian, especially in this context, and unless we tell you otherwise. Okay, so that's the Gaussian distribution. We've done the simple stuff. Now let's move into perhaps the new things. And so we're going to describe three different statistical tests and then a th process you can do to calculate a confidence interval. And so I frame them here as questions. So the F test would tell you, okay, if you have two sets of measurements, are the standard deviation values significantly different from each other? Is one measurement more precise than the other one? That's what the F test would tell you. Then the T test tells you, are your mean values different from each other? This is the one that we want to do most of the time, right? This is usually what we care about. You, it turns out you need to do the F test first before you can do a T test, so we'll talk about it first. But ultimately, this is the big hitter here. We want to know, okay, if you measured sample A and sample B, do they have the same answer? And that would mean, are your mean values the same within some error level that you find? And we use this phrase, statistically significant, or significantly different. And when we say that, that means basically do the test and see if this thing passes the test or not. So that's what kind of what we mean by significantly different. Like according to statistics, these things are actually different as opposed to, eh, eh I don't know, they might be different or not. Okay, another thing that we use the T distribution for is finding out the confidence intervals. And we'll talk about that a little more, but you can phrase that as, all right, I got my average how high and low, like above and below the average, do I need to spread to have a 95% chance that the true answer is in there somewhere? I mean, you're not really finding the true population mean, but, you know, is the true population mean somewhere in this range? So that's a confidence interval. And then we'll also quickly talk about a nifty little test for determining if a measurement is an outlier or not, the Grubbs test, which I'm sure you've all wanted to do that before. Can I throw away this data point? Ooh, I don't know. Okay, so let's talk about the F test. Again, oftentimes you do this test because you're going to do a T test next, but there are some scenarios where you want to know is one method more or less precise than another? So is the standard deviations of these two instruments or whatever methods, are they significantly larger or smaller? And again, significantly here means according to a statistical test. Now, the scenario that this textbook chapter gives, um, some horse trainers would inject bicarbonate into the horses before a race because it neutralizes the lactic acid that will build up during the race. This is banned. They test the horse's blood after the race and see. And so the, there was an instrument to measure this that went off the market. So now there's a new instrument that measures this. Is it as precise? Okay. So... Here's this data they have. There's an average, there's a standard deviation, and there's a number of measurements. And we will go about and use this. So here's the formula. It's crazy simple. I'll give it to you on an exam. These are technically variances because they're squared standard deviations. And you just take the ratio of the two. That part's simple. The F part is in honor of Ronald Fisher, who is the... 
kind of first person to work on variance ratios like this and kind of started the work on the number, the tables. who started work on variance ratios and developing the numbers that go in the tables that we'll use next. So, okay, so that's the F test. So when you do this, you put the larger number on top, F is always bigger than one. Remember that, you gotta just arrange the numbers so that F is bigger than one. There's not like a natural order, right? It's not like what you take first goes on top or whatever. You take two completely different sets of measurements, you can put them in either order. The numbers are designed that you make this bigger than one. All right, so now we're gonna compare the numbers in a table and the numbers in a table, there's a whole backstory as to where those came from and we're not gonna get into that. But basically, if you calculate a variance ratio here, and if your number is larger than the F in the table, then your difference is statistically significant. If your number is smaller, then your difference is not. So remember, we're gonna use degrees of freedom for this. So here's the example measurement again. So we have our data, we have the formula, we plug numbers in, I take the standard deviation of the measurement on the right and put it on top because it's bigger. Don't forget to square them. And here's your number. Now we're gonna need degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is the number of measurements minus one. So this one has three degrees of freedom, that has nine. Okay, so we take this number we calculate and we compare it to the numbers in the table. So here's the table. Again, these were all developed carefully according to a distribution and variance ratios and all these things. But we take the number in the table. Well, which number in the table? And we compare it to the number we just calculated. So remember, degrees of freedom and order matters here. So I always have to go back and check. Okay, S1's the one on the top. S1 has three degrees of freedom. All right, so S1, three degrees of freedom here. And then S2, we're gonna go down, there it is, right there. So we're comparing our number, we calculated 2.8. The number in the table is 3.86. So then you have to remember which way is which. So if your calculated number is larger than what's in the table, the difference is significant. Our calculated number is smaller than what's in the table, so these standard deviations are not actually different according to the statistics. How are you gonna remember this? Well, I always think that I like to root for something being different, right? You know, if you're showing a new drug, you want the drug to have a significant effect, so you want the number to be different, right? So I tend to remember that as, okay, I'm rooting for the number to be different, the, like the standard deviations to be different. So I always want my number to be bigger because bigger is better. Oh, my number is smaller than what's in the table. That means it's not significantly different. That's my memory trick. Again, find one for you if you, um, if that doesn't work for you. And just remember that, you know, if the calculated one is larger than what's in the table, then it's significant. Cool. So then we're gonna go to t-tests next. Before we get there, a little nuance about how you frame these tests, right? I frame them in my head as, um, do you win? Is it bigger? Because that works for me. Um, the technical way these things are framed is in terms of hypotheses, right? So you can say, all right, the null hypothesis is, uh, well, those are actually the same and not different. The alternative or not null is, hey, these things are different, right? So you can frame it that way as well. And you're testing for whether it's null or not. Then, okay, to kind of move towards t-tests, we can think about this, say we're looking at averages, right? If you have two distributions like this, notice that the two curves don't overlap in the middle. So like, these things are totally different. Your distribution you get for measuring one of them just doesn't overlap at all with the distribution of the other one then yeah, these are totally different. So here you would reject the null hypothesis. Now, all right, well, these ones, like these are pretty much the same. So there's no way that these are different. You know, here's all your kind of distribution of measurements if you plotted them and put a smooth curve over it. All right, so well, our null hypothesis is retained because these two are the same. Now, you really need t-tests when you get into this kind of situation where, um, I don't know, are those different? The distributions overlap some, so, you know, there's a chance that maybe you have a bunch of measurements in the middle here that could go for either side. Um, so you need to do the test here. 
And we're not going to know the true answer. We'll be able to just find what's the probability that these are actually significantly different or not. Okay, so t-test. First of all, what is t? So the t is just the name of the test. What is student? Student is a pseudonym. Do I have this on the next slide? Yeah, pseudonym by the person who developed this working at the Guinness Brewery. Well, Guinness didn't want to give out all their secrets, so he couldn't publish it. Like, hey, look at this cool new distribution I found. Um, so he just published it under the name student. Why he chose student? I don't know. Did he get fired for doing this? I don't know. But, okay, so this is a distribution, just like the Gaussian, but it's a little different, right? So if you have one degree of freedom, you have this purple curve, which is this one here, and it has a little broader tail, right? Basically, farther out from the mean, there's more chance of having your measurements if you only have one degree of freedom. Well, if you have two degrees of freedom, which is three measurements, all right, well, then it's a little less likely that you're way out here. You know, there's a lower chance of measuring values that are way out here, and so on and so forth. 10 degrees of freedom almost overlaps with the Gaussian or normal distribution. 30 degrees of freedom is pretty much identical to the Gaussian distribution. So by the time you hit 30 degrees of freedom, um, you could use the Gaussian distribution or not. Um, usually we don't do 30 replicates. So we're somewhere kind of in this intermediate zone. And that's one of the useful things about this distribution is it gives an adjustment to the Gaussian distribution based on how many times you've replicated the measurement. Okay, and yeah, this is something you wanna do when you don't know the true standard deviation, but you know the sample's standard deviation, like how many measurements you've done, what's your standard deviation, that kind of stuff. So all this is dumped into a table, it's a T table, and these values that are in this table come from kind of the width of the distribution in terms of the values and standard deviations and such. And again, it returns to the Gaussian distribution if you have infinite degrees of freedom. Now, on this axis, is different than the F-test table. On this direction, now we just have different confidence levels. And so a 50% confidence level is kind of just what that says. Like, you know, 50% chance that, uh, you know, this value is here or my means are the same or what. And then 95% chance that, you know, either my values are different or, or whatnot. And then you can go way more... Um, critical than that. Now we tend to use 95 a lot. Why do we choose 95? That's kind of a weird cultural thing. Maybe it's because it nicely matches two standard deviations from the mean and a Gaussian. So maybe that's why 95 is the popular one. But we usually use the 95% confidence level, but you'll see sometimes people use other ones as well. Okay, so the t-test is a test like the f-test. So we have some values that we plug into it. And then if our calculated T is greater than what's in the table, woohoo, the means are different statistically significantly. Okay, if what we calculate, this T value is lower than what's in the table, then that means you can't claim that you have statistically significant difference in your averages. Um, now, here's a critical point. There are different formulas to use depending on whether the standard deviations of the measurements are different or not. So this is what I was saying earlier. You have to do an F-test first to then figure out which of the formulas you're gonna to use to do your T-test. Okay, so I just kind of repeated those things on the top here. Now, let's actually show you what this formula looks like. All right, so T-test formula, a little more complicated than the other ones. Um, T is always positive. That's why this is in absolute value brackets here. It doesn't really matter which set of measurements is one or two, because again, you're taking the absolute value and it doesn't matter the order that you add in here. Um, now this is N, this is number of measurements in this formula. Um, and so since the standard deviations are not different, we can kind of mash them together and get a standard deviation that is applicable for both of the two experimental sets of measurements and use that to calculate T. So that's the pooled standard deviation, and you just basically take the formula and plug everything in. Now, when you go to use the t-table with this, you're gonna use the sum of the degrees of freedom of your two sets of measurements. And so, remember, degrees of freedom is number minus one, so if you take n1 minus one, n2 minus one, 
Well, that's the same as putting them together and then subtracting two. So you'll use the sum of the degrees of freedom in the T table. You'll see this thing in the denominator down here. You can use to help you remember that that's where you go looking in the T table. All right, different formulas for if the standard deviations are significantly different. Now you can't use a pooled standard deviation anymore. So you have kind of a different approach to it. So your calculated T value looks like this. Again, it's a formula, you plug numbers into it. Okay, here's the annoying part. The degrees of freedom, you can't just pull from the number of measurements. You have to calculate what the degrees of freedom are. And so you plug everything into this incredibly obnoxious formula. It's kind of repetitive because you're putting the same number in in a bunch of different places. Um, and then the number you get out of that, you round that to an integer, and then you go hit the table. All right, so then here's the table again. So remember, degrees of freedom goes down the side. You calculate the degrees of freedom if your standard deviations are significantly different. All right, that's this case. You use the sum minus two, like, you know, sum of your number of measurements, subtract two from it to get your sum degrees of freedom if you're doing this case, if your deviations are not significantly different. And that's where you look. And then, at least that's what row you look in. And then what column you look in is usually given in the problem, basically. It's what confidence level do you want to use to try to compare? How confident do you want to be? Do you want to say, oh, you know, there's a 95% chance that these means are the same, but there's a 5% chance they're not? Or do you need to know 99% chance that these means are the same or different? Just That just depends. And notice the numbers increase as you go up here, so you have to have a higher t-value to beat the number to then say that your values are significantly different. All right, so quick practice problem here. I'm gonna use the fact that it's a video. You can pause it and read the problem. The summary here is you have two sets of numbers. The top two rows are the standard method. The bottom two rows are the new method. Um, let's figure out whether there's a, there's a significant difference between the two methods. And this little alpha equals 0.05 here is another way of saying the 95% confidence interval because 100 minus 95 is five, but anyways. So before we go plug numbers into formulas, you're gonna to need to calculate what the standard deviations are of these sets of measurements and what the averages are. All right, once you do that, then you can plug that into here. So here's the F test. The new method is put on the top just so it makes this number bigger than one. All right, so now I'm pulling this example from the uh, Harvey textbook, and here he calls it critical value for F, and then instead of 95%, he calls it 0.05, and then 6, 6 is the um, degrees of freedom. And so here's the value that comes out of the table. Now, since our experimental value is smaller than what's in the table, these standard deviations are not significantly different. Cool, so that means we can pool our standard deviations when we go to the t-test. So here's the math for how you pool those together. That's 1.63. That number goes here when you're doing the t-test values. And then you plug this all in and do some arithmetic, and then you get a value for t from your experiment. Now you go compare this to the table. This has seven plus seven minus two degrees of freedom. So 14 minus two makes 12, so there's 12 degrees of freedom. We're going for the 95% confidence interval, and you get the value from the table is 2.179. Our number is a lot smaller than that, so that means our averages of these two methods are not significantly different, which in my memory trick, oh, bummer, I didn't beat the table. They're not significantly different. In the real world, well, you're probably trying to hope that your new method matches the standard method really well. So these authors were probably quite happy when they saw that the deviations and the means were not significantly different. Okay, now let's move on. We'll talk about confidence intervals. So this is using the same like math structure as the t-test. And that's why there's a t-value in this equation here. Um, but it does something different fundamentally. Instead of comparing two sets of measurements, we're using the t-tables to figure out where we think the real number lies. So the idea here is 
All right, you calculate a confidence interval, you have an average, and then you say, okay, I know that the true value has a 95% chance of being between average minus this and the average plus that. Again, you could have a 99% confidence interval. It'd be wider, but you could still say that I know there's a 99% chance that the true value is between this number and this number, which happens to have your average in the middle, and it's kind of above and below your average for where the true number is. Um, the degrees of freedom are still here, so the formula uses n, the table uses degrees of freedom n minus one, so keep that in mind. Um, and then you can just use the table. So I didn't put an example problem in here because it's like it's pretty simple to calculate. Um, you just have to remember what it means. So one of the applications of these confidence intervals is putting error bars on a graph. So you may have seen these before. Oftentimes you'll see data plotted in ways that have the data point in the middle here, and then these little bars that stick out up and below. And so these bars tell you something. They tell you, in this case, they tell you what the 95 confidence interval is. Sorry, what the 95% confidence interval is. Now, this measurement at 15 micrograms of protein, it had a much bigger standard deviation, so the 95% confidence interval is a lot wider in a way, or taller as this graph is put. And that's just what the measurement says. Okay. So you can do this, you can put this in your plots in Excel. I don't know offhand if Google Sheets can do it. Excel certainly can. Um, the directions here, I mean, this book is probably old, so I don't know if the directions are still correct, but you can always Google it. And just remember that the error bars are this value above and that value below the point. Okay. You gotta be a little careful here because some graphs use their error bars as just the standard deviation above and below. And you've probably written this before because we probably trained you to do this, right? Take the average plus or minus the standard deviation. And so you see that on plots and that's okay. Um, other graphs use the confidence interval. This is CI, not CL. Silly sans serif fonts. Um, you know, some other graphs use a different thing called standard error of the mean. So it's your job to specify if you put error bars on that your error bars are the 95% confidence interval or whatever they are. Cool. All right, last thing for the video, the Grubbs test for an outlier. So this is again, something you've always wanted to do is throw out bad data. So there's a test for that that you basically plug in the bad value or the questionable value, maybe bad, and you have the average that goes there, put the standard deviation under it. When doing this, you calculate the average and standard deviation with the questionable point. So that's this. And then, I mean, you're always trying to throw out that bad data point. So if you beat the table, sweet, you get to throw out the bad data point. So that is if your calculated G value is bigger than what's in the table. Now this textbook gives G values for a 95% confidence that the questionable point is not part of your data set. And so those are the values we'll use, seems fine to me. And yeah, so you just plug the numbers in and see what you get. So here's an example. In this set of data that was from a previous problem, is this number an outlier? Well, let's find out. So you compute the average value that goes here, you compute the standard deviation here, you, and those numbers include the questionable point when you calculate them. And then the questionable value goes here, you calculate your number. Cool. Now the number of observations is in this table. It's not degrees of freedom, which is frustratingly annoying, but that's the way these things are phrased. And so there's seven values here. And if you have seven values, well, the G number that you calculate needs to be greater than 1.938 if you're going to throw out the data point. So 1.67 is not. So you keep the data point in. So there's a 95% chance that this data point might be part of your actual measurement and it's not some fluky outlier. Now, that said, if when you're measuring things, you know you spilled some of it, uh, then you have a really good reason for throwing out the data point if it's an outlier, right? So this statistical test is assuming that you did everything correctly, you know, are you statistically getting some weird things?
and that's not who oh, I messed that up. I better throw that data point out, which is another story, and we can always talk about that. But again, the statistics are assuming that all the experimental procedures were done right. Cool. So that's what I've got for this slideshow. Um, one last thing to say before I end, and I'm kind of that ins I was inspired by what I was saying before, is right. All the statistics here are for random errors. Now, if there's a determinant error, like your pH probe is calibrated wrong, well, you can still get very nice statistics out of it, and your number's wrong. And the statistics can't tell you anything about that, right? So you have to separately worry about determinant errors, things that will always throw your measurement off the same direction, roughly the same magnitude. you got to worry about those separately from the kind of statistical stuff that we're talking about in this slideshow here. Cool. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in class.